Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, folks. My name is Lyle, and I am an alcoholic. Really good to be here. I was here, I don't know, I think a couple of years ago, so if there's somebody out there going, oh, God, I heard this guy, you're free to leave. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, uh, I, I'm i just in awe of this program and this fellowship. Um, last time I was here, I was surprised. I met a fellow pilot from Northwest that was here. I had no idea he was in the program, none. He since passed away from cancer, and uh, he and I were quite close, and we had some really wonderful moments <clears throat> together. And a few minutes ago, <clears throat> excuse me, another one walks up here. I'll turn around and look. It's one of the best all-time guys I ever flew with, Bill P., one of my favorite, favorite guys. We had more fun. I had no idea he was in the program. No, I am going. I thought maybe somebody told him, and he just he said, so-and-so is my sponsor. I said, your sponsor? You in this? Oh, yeah. I'm going, God, we got a high incidence of this going around here. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> I never knew he had a problem. I'm, I suspect he may have thought I did. But I remember he came back from a trip one time, and um, we'd, we'd been having a good time. <laughs> and we weren't quite ready to quit. And he says, why don't you come on over to my place? And I said, okay. He says, well, it's not very much. It's kind of naked because my wife left took everything with her and uh, I walk into this place and it was bare and he must have seen the he, there was a boom box up on the shelf that's all I saw in there was this boom box and I'm looking around and he must have seen it he said well that's my home entertainment center and <laughs> <clears throat> but he had some booze and that's that's what we were after but uh, God it's just terrific to see you again Bill and and uh, I'd heard there may be some flight attendant friends of mine out here that were coming in tonight and I'm just in awe of this. I, people show up and are part of this, and I had no idea they would ever be here. And I certainly didn't want to be here. <clears throat> I was one of them that used to hold A in great contempt and disdain and make the jokes about it, and uh, I had absolutely no respect for this fellowship. Did not want to be here at all. I had to cut an arm off to avoid this. <clears throat> and I get to go places and do things and meet people today, and, <clears throat> and I think... Thank God I didn't get my way because I would have missed all of these experiences, these unbelievable experiences that I've gotten to <clears throat> be part of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> over the years. And, and it, it, didn't work, it didn't go my way. Um, I'm going to try to keep this uh, in the context of what I was like, what happened, and, and um, what I'm like now. I, you know, I used to say what it was like, and I hear speakers do that. I don't think that's a great big deal, but some people do. And uh, <clears throat> I got a, a very cryptic email from a guy in southwest Georgia who um, took me to task for that, and he says, I was sitting here listening to one of your CDs with a newcomer, and you're misquoting the big book. And I thought, I don't quote the big book when I go to the podium anyway. What's he talking about? But I put my, uh, oh, thanks, Dave, thanks, that'll help. <clears throat> I put my happy AA face on. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> made an amend, said, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> he couldn't see my expression, but he must have sensed it. Because he sent back another email. He said, well, it's really kind of important. You know, he says, uh, oh, I'm an old timer down here. <clears throat> if we had been sitting on the front row and you started off that way, some of us might have gotten up and walked out figuring if you're going to misquote the book to begin with, it can't be, the rest of the message can't be that good. I took my happy A face off at that point <clears throat> and uh, my competitive spirit came jumping up and I said, well, you know, I said if that had happened, I don't think I would burst into tears at the podium. <clears throat> and I said, I don't think I'd rush out and get something to drink. I said, but as long as this has become a topic, I said, let me just remind you that when we read how it works, it doesn't say, rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly memorized this book. <clears throat> and I didn't get any more emails. 
<clears throat> he and I later became pretty good friends. I saw him at a conference over in that area. But he made his point because I can't go up there and say how what it was like anymore. <clears throat> so um, one of the guys told me, he said, well, there's a difference between being a big book thumper and a big book lawyer. And uh, I have a lot of respect for the, the big book. I do respect it. It's just that I, I don't do a lot of quoting from it. <clears throat> um, I'm going to mix the order up. Oh, well, I'll tell you my sobriety day is March 7th, 1990. Uh, I will talk about three days, generally March 7th, 8th, and 9th, that were very, very intense and have remained so over all these years, and I hope they never lessen in their intensity because I never want to forget what was going on. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's amazing. Uh, I, I'm going to start with what happened because it was a national attention getter. And I got to treatment, and... Um, People said to me the same things they say to other people, you know, we've been waiting for you, and I didn't find much humor in that. And <clears throat> if you can't remember your last drunk, maybe you haven't had it yet. And I'd look at him, I'd think, I don't know how much of a problem that is for you. But I had Peter Jennings and Tom Brokaw and Dan Rather telling the whole world about mine. <clears throat> and so I don't think I'll have a trouble, any problem remembering the date. On March the uh, 7th, I went into a place in Fargo. I did not know that that was going to be my series of last drinks, at least up to this point. I had no idea. The next morning, <clears throat> March the 8th, very early in the morning, an event took place that had never, ever come to the public's attention before, and that was uh, three airline pilots were arrested for flying from Far Fargo, North Dakota, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. They were arrested for having flown um, impaired, drunk. Never happened before, <clears throat> and um, and I was the captain of that crew. Generally speaking, when we come to the podium, we don't talk about what we did for a living. It hasn't got anything to do with the story of recovery. The only reason I talk about it was because it was a key part of the story. It was what drove the story, what drove the media, what created all the attention, <clears throat> and what set me up for a federal felony prison conviction. So it's in that context only. I'm not an airline pilot who's an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic who, through a lot of good fortune and good happenstance things that I'll talk about, got to be an airline pilot. <clears throat> I don't believe we have any prestige or status in this fellowship. That's my take on it. I don't care if you're an airline pilot, if you're a doctor or a lawyer, if you work at a construction gang or you were living under a bridge two weeks ago. I think when we come here, if we achieve that one thing called sobriety, we have the same status, period. That's the only thing that we get while we're here. It makes us all equal. And I'm not big on AA <clears throat> celebrity stuff. Um, I maintain that until I get an email saying that we just broke ground on the AA Hall of Fame. I'm going to continue that thinking. And um, <clears throat> So um, I talk about this not because I was an airline pilot, but because it was what drove the story. I was um, When I walked off the airplane that morning... I saw um, two airport policemen. I saw Northwest Airlines company officials. I saw FAA people. I could leave the airline anonymous if I wished, but I hope by the time I get done with this, you understand why I don't. Northwest at that time was the only major carrier that did not have a program for airline pilots. They had refused to go along with the rest of the industry. The industry standard is very good. It's a long, involved, complex, complicated, heavy-duty accounting reporting system and they boast a very, very high success rate, not because they're dealing with airline pilots, but because there's a huge amount of accountability that goes on for three, three years. The only other program that uh, parallels that is the doctors, and they go on for five in most places. Um, the Northwest had refused to go along with that. And um, I can tell you that the, the instant feeling that I had when I stepped off the airplane and I saw these people, was one of incredible, indescribable shame and disgrace. I used to uh, <clears throat> try to find the words for that because I thought it was really important that I convey that to you. And the big book says it very succinctly when it talks about pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I don't think it can be said any better than that. What I didn't know was that that feeling of shame and disgrace and dishonor that hit me right immediately, went all the way to the bone marrow, was just going to get exponentially worse as the days ahead unfolded. 
<clears throat> to the point where I really didn't want to live because this wasn't supposed to happen to me. This was not what my life had been about. I hadn't been raised to be an alcoholic. I'm going to talk about two parents who died from this disease, but the shame, I think, some of it, maybe perhaps much of it, came from the fact that I had raised three children and I had been the standard bearer in that family for things like duty, honor, country, character, honesty, integrity, do the right thing. And in the midst of what was taking place, it, everything I said over all those years seemed so hollow and meaningless because I was on my way to becoming a national pariah in disgrace. I had a hard time with that. <clears throat> Later, after I got sober and the good things happened, I saw a thing in the meditation book that helped with that. It said, my father didn't tell me how to live. He lived and let me watch him do it. And I thought perhaps what my kids have had to watch with this journey and how it went all the way down and all the way back up was of more value than anything I ever said to them. And I had never thought that I was going to have to live out that kind of an example. But the shame was just horrific, just horrific. There had been incidents at Northwest <clears throat> over the years, periodically, where some pilot got in trouble for drinking. And most of us knew who those... Well, we knew. They, it swept the airline like wildfire. So I knew the names and uh, who was involved and where they, these things took place. And I suspect we all had our own little private hall of shame. And in the millions of thoughts that were occurring that day, I thought, that's where my name goes. That's the legacy I leave here. I'm on that hall of shame. I wasn't supposed to be. We were detained for 12 hours that day. We gave blood at two different facilities. At the second facility, there was a reporter who saw two uniformed comps and three uniformed pilots, thought there was going to be a story there, and that's how it broke to the public. I had no idea that was taking place at that time. It was just incredibly horrible that I knew it was going to sweep Northwest Airlines. I had no idea it was going to go all over the country and stay on the, on the media for the news for weeks and weeks and weeks that the nightline, or nighttime comics were going to enjoy it, that I was going to see my name and my picture in all of these publications, and that all of this was going to be so, so public. I um, <clears throat> got back to a commuter apartment at the end of the day. It was very surreal. There were times when I thought I was watching somebody else go through this. I couldn't believe this was me actually experiencing this couldn't be me. And then I would have these flashback moments. I'd look around and I'd almost get physically sick because I knew it was happening. It was happening to me. Absolutely unbelievable, but it was happening to me. I got back to the commute apartment and I thought for the first time I was supposed to be home tonight. And I called my home and my wife had waited at the Atlanta airport for four hours waiting on me to come in, and I never showed, and she was still gone, and I heard my voice on the answering machine, didn't know what I was going to say. And all I got out was a very muted, defeated message. I said, there's been a disaster. I think I've lost my job. I'll be home on first flight in the morning. I don't know why she didn't call me back, having received that phone message, but later I looked at that and thought, what a gift that was. I was just sick. I want to talk about this. And I got home the next morning. I knew I would never wear a uniform again, ever. I exited the airport as quickly as I could because I knew a lot of people there, and I didn't want anybody to see me or stop me. And uh, Barbara was parked out to the curb to the right as I exited, and I've never told a story, but I didn't say I had to, felt like I had to climb over the curb to get in the car with her. She and I had been married a long time, and I couldn't look at her. She's my wife, and I couldn't look at her. She pulled away from the curb, and I said, Honey, I'm so sorry. She said, who better than I could possibly understand how you feel right now? She's got a very soft South Texas accent. She never said a word to me all the way home. Again, another gift. She had every right, and it would have been normal to say, why were you there? You knew what Northwest policy was. These pilots drank, and they came to their company's attention. They were terminated immediately, and they never came back. She never said a word to me. We drove home. <clears throat> she went to work, and I walked inside the house. I did not want to be in my own skin. I could not stay still. 
And I went to the phone and I called a doctor. He was a Ph.D. family therapist that gets involved in the story here in a little bit. He was the only person I knew to call. And uh, I said, I have to declare an emergency. I need to see you right away. And he said, come straight in. So I drove over to his office. It was like it happened five minutes ago. I can still see the office. I see the color of the walls. I see the counter, the layout. I walked in. <clears throat> the good thing about my condition at this point was I was done. I was just all flat done. I was through. So I didn't try to cut corners. I didn't try to hedge the answers. I didn't try to minimize anything. I just told him what happened. He had this look of real stunned shock and surprise on his face. He said, God, Lyle, he said, this is horrible. This is absolutely horrible. This is now March the 9th. It's a Friday. He walked over towards his desk, and he stopped, and he turned, and he looked at me, and there would be two statements made that day that I simply could not fathom or process. I had no idea why they would be said or, or what they meant. And I heard the first one just then because he looked at me and he said, that maybe this is what had to happen. I did not know why he would say that to me. He left and he came back a few months later and he said, um, I called a doctor that I used to work with years ago. He's on staff at a treatment facility and he said he's a very prominent doctor here in Atlanta. He's a psychiatrist. He's a certified, he's a recovering alcoholic and cocaine addict and he's certified in addiction medicine. And I had never heard of addiction medicine. I had no idea there was such a thing. He said he wants to see you at six o'clock tonight. Now this is a Friday. Even as shredded as I was in the condition I was in, that registered. That conveyed something to me in terms of urgency. Later, this doctor told me, he said, based on your, your appearance, I was afraid you were a suicide. I thought, I don't know what I look like, but I do know what I felt like. And he was getting pretty close. Barbara and I drove to this doctor's office at 6 o'clock, clear across Atlanta, following a set of instructions. I have absolutely no memory of that meeting. It's just like an alcoholic blackout. I hadn't eaten or drank anything for two days, but I simply don't recall the meeting, except to know I was there. I don't know if I was in there 10 minutes or an hour. I know that every time he asked me a question, I gave him as straight an answer as I possibly could at that moment. Straight answer. He looked at me at some point. He said, Law, you're an alcoholic, and you need to get into treatment tonight. I remember not having a reaction to that, and that's significant because I've hated alcoholics. I've hated alcoholics since I've seen them, since I watched two parents who were alcoholics, since I saw alcoholics in my native community, since I saw alcoholics in the layovers, in the alleyways, on the benches, in the doorways. They were life's losers. They never accomplished. They never achieved. They simply sucked society dry and drank their booze. And that wasn't me. But in the 24 hours since the arrest, in some way, somehow, some level, I connected the dots, and I knew. I knew I was an alcoholic because I just lost a lifetime of work because I start to drink and I can't stop. I don't stop. I said to him, I said, I thought you'd probably tell me that, and I'm okay with it. But I said, I just got home tonight. I said, please, let me go home and let Barbara hang on to me and let my, let my mind uncoil. Just let me absorb what's happened. Please. He said, you need to get into treatment tonight. I took a breath and said, okay. So he drove, he wrote out some instructions for this treatment center again back across Atlanta. I didn't know it was two and a half miles from the Atlanta airport. I didn't have any reason to know anything about this treatment center. And we drove back to it. And as we made the final turn, the headlights hit a sign that was there then. It's not now, but it, I was very close by. It was right in front of me. It said Anchor Hospital, a hospital for alcoholism and other chemical dependencies. And I sat there with the sign direct, or the lights directly on the sign in front of me. It was like somebody just kicked me right in the gut. And I thought, how in God's name did my life end up this way? I'm going into a treatment center for alcoholics. How did this happen? And I had a little quick mini flashback 
of my life up to that point was some of the really high points and the accomplishments and achievements, most of them against the odds, and I was really so proud of that I, they, I hung those on my wall. You know, those were the things that kind of defined me and made me who I was and gave me some kind of an identity, and all of a sudden they were gone, and I wasn't even sure if they'd really ever existed. And I remember sitting there com completely devoid of any value as a human being, had no self-worth. I just didn't count. Some years later, I read a um, report by one of the doctors in treatment centers, summarizing paragraphs, said this. It said, given the history and background of this man, it was unlikely to believe he would ever be a productive member of society. I remember kind of flinching at that, thinking, God darn, that's pretty damn dismal. <laughs> and uh, my second thought was, I was the one that gave him all the information. So, <laughs> We started down the hill <clears throat> into the treatment center. For the first time that day, I thought, this is March the 9th. This is my 27th wedding anniversary. And again, I said in that real low, defeated voice, I said, hell of a way to spend an anniversary, huh? And from the right side, that soft South Texas voice came that second comment that I could not fathom. She said it might be the best one we ever had. I thought, who could think that? Who could think that right now? And I didn't respond. I want to lighten this up a little bit and tell you that a couple of years ago, our anniversary rolled around, and up the driveway, surprisingly, came one of my sponsees. Didn't expect him, and he said, I know what this is. I've heard the story. It's March the 9th, your anniversary. Just want to come by and wish you guys happy anniversary. And I said, well, great. Come on in. Let's have some coffee. We're sitting around. Everybody's lighthearted and bubbly. And he says, well, he said, what's the secret to having stayed married so long? And I didn't get a chance to say anything. Barbara said, mostly due to the fact that I can never stand to admit I made a mistake. <laughs> This is an ego-deflating program, and she considers that her job. <laughs> and does it very well, I might add. I'm going to go back, really, at the beginning, and I'll come back and try to pick up here if I can. I tell you, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, September 1938. So I'm about 72 and a half years old. And um, I tell you that to get it out of the way, because I know I'm not the only one that sits out there and tries to figure out how old the speaker is. I do it all the time. And uh, <clears throat> usually before the talk is over, I've got it pretty well pegged. I've noticed the, um, the people in A that are the most devious and cunning and deceptive are the women speakers. And I don't know if that's uh, by design or just natural. But <clears throat> they will say things like, um, I got out of college, and so I go, well, she's either 21 or 22 at that point. Um, the year that uh, Kennedy was assassinated, I'm going, Jesus Christ, was that 1963 or when? And, uh, <laughs> and she'll say, I had my first child. I was 26. It was two years after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I'm going, the hell was that? That's 68. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and by the time she's done, she's leaving. I'm going, well, I think she's either 43 or 68. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, so, so. So I just get it out of the way. The, um, I uh, grew up in a um, World War II housing project on the southeast edge of Wichita. It's a very economically de depressed place called Plainview. But I was happy there. It was uh, kind of 1950s happy days. Everybody out there was in the same economic condition, stat strata. And I, I was happy. I remember... We didn't have any drugs. It was before drugs and drive-by shootings and school shooting incidents. It was, I was okay with that. <clears throat> it was a very diverse community. It was mixed um, black and white and Hispanic and a small Native American segment. And I was part of the Native American segment. <clears throat> and I'm a, um, an ethnic mix of several different things. The two that seem to always want to follow me to the bar are the Irish and Comanche parts. And uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I've never seemed to be able to leave those anywhere. <clears throat> um, actually, I thought it was um, 
kind of a good mix. I, I really love the Irish music, and uh, I knew all those. I had the albums and knew the freedom songs and drinking songs and rebel songs, and I just loved those places. And I was flying around the country. I knew where those places were. They had live Irish entertainment, whether I was in Washington or Boston or uh, Chicago, and, and I'd beeline for those places, and I'd literally be the last one out the door. When the band quit playing, I'd sit in there sing along with Wild Colonial Boy and Black Girl in the Black Velvet Band, just have a great time. And then um, I might be someplace else, or the mood was different, or so the other side would kick in, and I'd think, this would be a good night just to go have a few drinks and kill some white people. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> my Comanche name is Yatsatanapa, which means flying man. And uh, I was a very active member of that community and grew up in the powwows and was a dancer and have since returned since I've been sober and do a lot of stuff in native sobriety, and uh, I'm dancing again. And uh, <clears throat> I um, never go to the podium without thanking my parents, even though this disease killed both of them, because they weren't drunk all the time. And during the times that they weren't drunk, before the disease finally took them away, they gave me a lot of good things and taught me a lot of good things, and I'm indebted to my parents. And I always make that a point when I'm at the podium. When I was 14, the alcohol had really ripped the family apart. It completely imploded. A lot of bad things were happening. And my parents got their first divorce, and it really affected me. And I got a sister who's two years younger than I am. It affected her even more. By the time I graduated from high school, three years later, <clears throat> um, my parents had each been married and divorced two more times. I had four sets of step-parents and I don't like any of them, didn't like any of the step-siblings, wouldn't know them or recognize them or remember them if they were in the room tonight. And I didn't play well. And uh, I would get in some trouble, and they'd ask me to go to the other family, and so I'd go over there, and something would happen over there. <clears throat> After a little while, I'd go back. Faces and names had changed, and that's kind of how I traversed through high school that way, <clears throat> very nomadically. I was a good student when I applied myself, but nobody cared, nobody watched. I was all by myself. And so I just screwed away an awful lot of my academic opportunity that was available. And um, <clears throat> was an athlete, probably average at best, although I thought I was pretty good. And uh, <clears throat> when I graduated from high school, um, most of the people from my part of the city did not go to college. Uh, they married their little high school sweetheart and went to work at one of the aircraft factories at, Bo uh, at Wichita is quite famous for and known for, Boeing Beach Cessna, and there were some more there. I wasn't interested in that, didn't have a girlfriend. I was going to join the service. <clears throat> One of my buddies came back from the Marine Corps and uh, looked pretty spiffy, and uh, he and I hooked up and went over to the bar and spent several hours over there. And he regaled me with these <clears throat> really cruel, sadistic stories of what Marine drill instructors do to their recruits. And I was hanging on every word. And um, it was probably an early sign of flawed thinking because I was 18 by this time, and I thought, man, I just can't wait to go do that. And... Uh, <laughs> Within a couple of days, I'd found a Marine recruiter signed on the line, and I head for boot camp. My story is a little bit different <clears throat> in some respects. I hear an awful lot of stories over the course of a year. There's a common theme, and it's true for the people who come here and tell you that it will not be true for me tonight, and that is I never fit in, never belonged, and when I took that first drink, I'd found what I was looking for. Neither one of those statements apply to me. <clears throat> this is a chronic progressive disease. We progress at different rates, and I was not an instant alcoholic. I certainly had the genetic predisposition with two alcoholic parents. It was a certainty that if I drank and continued to drink, I was going to be an alcoholic, but I didn't know anything about that and wouldn't have believed it anyway. So, But it, did, it took me a while. <clears throat> so I went into Marine boot camp with the idea of just doing the best I could, and I just wanted to complete 13 weeks. And uh, <clears throat> once I snapped into it, I liked it. I really loved it. And I found where I belonged. I found what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be. It was uh, only somebody that's been through Marine Boot Camp can tell you what that is like. Extraordinarily intense and competitive. And there was a component to it that I had never experienced before, this camaraderie, this brotherhood of Marine Corps. I had never felt that or sensed it, and boy, did I like that. And so I, this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a Marine and as we approached the final week, the 13th week, the drill instructors, there were about 70 of us, drill instructors got us together and called out three names, three top guys in the platoon. Mine was the second name called. And I was surprised. I was shocked. I hadn't, didn't know that. <clears throat> and, uh, 
that I was extraordinarily proud. I got one stripe, one stripe, private first class. And I could not take my eyes off of my sleeve. I'm looking out there, that red bordered one stripe, <clears throat> private first class prowse. And we went to Camp Pendleton. It's raining outside. My, all my comrades have guard duty. They're outside in the rain, but because of my heavy rank, I'm inside. I'm acting corporal of the guard. And I look over in the corner, and there's a first lieutenant uniform hanging up over there. And I kind of kicked back, and I looked at it. I thought, my God, the rate I'm moving up, general can't be too far away. And, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> and that's where I was, because I was going to stay there. So I did find where I belonged and where I fit. Four and a half years later, and I did well. <clears throat> Throughout the course of my story, my drinking continues to progress. I'm not going to do a drunk log. I just don't have time. It's important to get it out there, and I, I just don't have time to get it all in. <clears throat> but I drank like everybody else in here did. I got drunk. I lost cars. I got in fights. I woke up places I didn't know where I was or how I got there. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had two DWIs uh, separated by about um, five or six years. I was convinced that was just bad luck, coincidence. Could have happened to anybody. I got a good ending, but it talks about DWIs. He said he was in court for his sixth DWI before he finally learned that did not stand for drinking with Indians. And <laughs> so, <clears throat> four and a half years later, I came walking in, and my commanding officer took me into his office. He said, you're the only guy in this unit who qualifies for a brand new program that's out there called Marine Aviation Cadet. You're the only one who has entry scores that are high enough to even consider going into that. I'd always wanted to fly, but that was never reality-based. In my view, pilots, people that got to fly, didn't come from a World War II housing project. They didn't come with a high school education. They didn't come out of an alcoholic home, and they didn't come out of a Native American segment. I didn't have a lot going for me. The people I thought that got to fly came from Eastboro and other ritzy sections of Wichita. They went to college. Their families had some prestige and status, and those were the people that got to be pilots. And he tells me I can go take a test. It's going to take all day, but I can go take a test. So I went over and took the test and passed. He said, that's good. But he said, I also need to tell you that this is an 18-month program, and roughly 50% of the people are going to wash out. And you're one of a very, very, very select few who will be coming in from the enlisted side. 98 99% are coming in from the civilian side, and they have to have two years college minimum, and most will have more than that, and those will be the people that you'll be running this race with. Well, I could do the thinking. <clears throat> if half weren't going to make it, and I'm starting off way behind educationally, I stood a good chance of not making it. And I really wanted to fly. And I thought about it for a day or two and said, I want to do it. So I went home to Wichita. They were having a powwow. I'm getting ready to go to Pensacola the next day. And they had. A, I went out and danced. And they had a special for me, which is what we do. Not a big deal. Just an honoring dance. I was going away. And I went around the arena. People came out, shook my head, and tailed in. And <clears throat> But all the way to Pensacola the next day, I was really impacted by that. I thought, I cannot come back to this community as a failure. There is no way I can come back with my tail between my legs and say, I didn't make it because I'm the only one who has a chance to do this. And I was driven with that for 18 months. There were four phases to flight training at that time. And in every one of the phases, I was the number two guy. The first time I was convinced it was administrative error, but I was just going to leave it alone. And throughout the rest of the phases, I never felt cocky or confident or complacent. I looked at my grades. I didn't believe I was as good as the grades indicated. I was watching my friends wash out weekly, sometimes daily. I don't remember any of them ever meeting my eyes when they came to say goodbye. Sea bag over the shoulder, head down, disappointed, sad. And they left, and I would never see them again. And I thought, one of these days, before this is over with, they'll get me. And so I never quit giving maximum effort. And again, I owe that to my parents, because they taught me how to work. And they did it through their own example. The final six months of flight training, <clears throat> I left the Florida area and went to Texas for advanced jet flight training. I got in there on a Friday night. I got drunk with a whole bunch of my buddies. We'd gotten separated along the way. We were at the officer's club. They said, let's go into town, Cain, uh, Beeville, Texas. There's a place called Canes. It's an old-fashioned drive-in. Good-looking girls hang out there. Lots of good-looking South Texas girls, I can tell you. And I was never very gutsy with the girls, <clears throat> but I had a lot to drink, and they wanted to go, and I said, sure, I'll go. So we went in, 
they immediately went after this carload of girls, and I thought, well, I'll hang back and have a few more drinks. I don't know about you, but <clears throat> magical things happen to me when I'm drinking. And uh, <laughs> I noticed the driver wasn't talking to anybody, and um, she was the one I was going to talk with, so I, I mentally rehearsed several things. And I was, um, I outdid myself. I thought, these are so good that she'll probably just sit there and take her clothes off. And, uh, <laughs> and so I go up to the driver's window, and she looks at me, and she is good looking. And everything left, vanished. I didn't know what I was going to say. I don't know where it went, but it wasn't anywhere close. And I'm standing there, and she's got some look of expectation. And all I could think of as I looked at her was, you got the most beautiful brown eyes I've ever seen. But it was late in the evening, and it kind of came out like, ah, she goes, there's brown eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me with this look, and, and I turned around and walked off. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I've been drunk a lot of times. I don't remember ever not being drunk uh, but when I was drinking, but um, I know that's not true, but uh, it's my memory. There have been very few times I was so drunk that I knew I couldn't talk. There have been a lot of times when I couldn't talk, but I didn't know that. And uh, I thought, this is a time. I, I can't talk, and I know I can't talk. And then on top of that, the thing is even worse is that I'm not so drunk, I can't yet still be embarrassed. And so I leave, and I'm not going back. And uh, I'm standing back there drinking because that's the thing to do And now. And uh, she gets out a little while later and goes into the ladies' room. And I get a good look at her. I mean, a good look. And she's got turquoise shorts on. I'm looking, I'm going, God darn it. Turquoise short, she's really got a cute butt and, and shapely legs and brown eyes, way more than I had on my list. And, and, um, <laughs> and I actually had an A thought then. I didn't know it was an A thought. Wouldn't know it was an A thought until about 29 more years. And I, cause I'm watching her walk in there and I'm getting a lot of time to look. I'm thinking, you know, I really want what she has and I'm willing to go to any length to get it. And, <laughs> And I did. And um, I had a chance encounter with her the next day. She was with a girlfriend. I was with a buddy of mine. And uh, I saw them go into this um, place, and I just almost wrecked the car just getting in there. And I walked in. I was scared, and I was nervous, but I was sober. She let us sit down, bought him some coffee, talked. She gave me her name, and she and I began to date. And on February the 25th, 1963, her 20th birthday, she pinned a set of gold wings over my heart. She pinned two gold bars on my shoulders. My dreams had come true. Throughout all of this, I was drinking hard and heavy. I mean, I when I hit the beach, I hit it running. I was I got drunk every time. And the big book talks about this. It's, we can manage our drinking at some point in time. <clears throat> I was managing my drinking. I got drunk, but on Saturday night, I quit because I had something that was more important then than the booze. I had a goal, and that took priority at that point in time over the booze. And so all day Sunday, this is before Vietnam, all day Sunday I was getting well, I was steady, and I was gearing up for what was coming up starting Monday. That wasn't true later on. But I had completed, and I thought Hollywood couldn't have scripted a better day. I got, I'm a commissioned Marine Corps second lieutenant. I'm going to be a fighter pilot with gold wings, and I got a good-looking girl. We went north to Wichita for three weeks leave. She stayed with my sister. I stayed with my dad, who was doing very poorly at the time. And as the leave was coming to an end, I thought, I don't want to lose her. I called her, and I said, let's go down to Oklahoma and get married. So we went down there with a buddy of mine and his wife. They took the rings off, loaned, them, loaned us their rings. We stood in front of a justice piece, and we got married. And we just celebrated 48 years in uh, March. <clears throat> She joined me out in California. I joined one of the finest Marine squadrons ever put together. We still have reunions every two years. I don't know of another Marine squadron that does that today. These are my Vietnam buddies. And I uh, was just with them the first week in April. Barbara's one of the two or three or four wives that were original. Uh, the, the rest of us, several of them have died. A lot of them have been recycled. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's one of the original. She was instantly pregnant. Go figure. And um, we had a little boy. Eight days less than a year later, we had another boy. And I used to really get tired of people coming up and going, you guys Catholic? <laughs> uh, 
I'd say, no, we're not Catholic. We're just horny Protestants. We don't have any problem with this. <laughs> I used to think, why do they think only Catholics can do this? Um, <laughs> I went to Vietnam. We were one of the first jet squadrons into Vietnam. We flew out of a little place south of Da Nang called Chu Lai. It was um, very primitive. One of the first squadrons in there. Sand, tents, sea rations, all marine enclosed in perimeter. Enemy controlled everything beyond the perimeter. We flew off of a little portable landing strip made out of aluminum planking. It was half of what we normally would need, but we, all, we were all carrier qualified, so all the landings were carrier landings into carrier gear. Jet assist takeoffs, prim living was primitive. We had no booze at first when we got over there. And um, we acquitted ourselves very well. We did a really good job. I was with 20 of the finest pilots that I'll ever experience in my entire life. And I look at it and I think, what an honor and a privilege to be in their midst, to be able to be with them. And uh, as I said, we still get together every two years, those of us who are left. I uh, picked up some personal decorations over there. I was able to put in for a regular commission, which would guarantee me a, a Marine Corps career. And I thought, there is no way on God's earth that the Marine Corps will ever give a regular commission to an officer who has a high school education. Those normally, it's got to have a college degree for that. And I'll be doggone, I got it. You see, what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to work hard, and I'm supposed to achieve and accomplish. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's just what I'm supposed to do. I'm not supposed to go into a place in Fargo, disgrace myself, and wipe out a career and bring all the tragedy to my family. That's not what I'm supposed to do. But that's what the disease does for me. I came back from Vietnam, <clears throat> and I spent another two and a half years in as a flight instructor, drinking really hard having a lot of drinking adventures. But I, I never hurt anybody in, in terms of phys I didn't hit anybody in the car and kill them. I had stories that were being circulated about me that were what I called colorful. As a matter of fact, I was proud of them. And uh, <clears throat> they were really adding to, to the persona. And um, I was getting away with it. I really got away with it. I didn't have any consequences. I finally decided to get out of the Marine Corps. <clears throat> because of my kids. I was going to be gone uh, four to six years, and I said, I, I promised Barbara we're not going to have that kind of family. And she had never pushed me for this. I wrote a very painful anguish letter of resignation, and I gave up my commission. I'd gone into the Marine Corps 11 and a half years early as a barely 18-year-old kid right out of high school. I came out as a decorated captain, fighter pilot, with a great reputation and some good stuff behind me. Three weeks later, I was in class at Northwest Airlines in August of 1968. And for nearly 22 years, things went about the same. I loved the work. I loved the people. I loved going to work. I loved the job. And it was great. Barbara and I had talked about adopting a child even before we got married. I said, let's either do it or quit talking about it. And we got to Northwest, and we put in for an adoption. And they struggled with us because we had the two boys biologically. We fought hard for 14 uh, months, and we adopted this little Indian girl. And she came to our home when she was 17 days old, the most beautiful little girl I've ever seen. Barbara now had her daughter. We had the perfect everything, the perfect career, the perfect neighborhood, the perfect family. Everything was right. And I learned what little girls do to their dads because I had those two rough and tumble boys, but my girl was just really special. And she couldn't walk past me without me picking her up, saying, come here with you, Don. And I'd look in that little face, and I'd kiss her, and I'd say, thanks for being my girl. She'd say, thanks for being my dad. And when she was 17, she ran away from home. And uh, I don't know if I had not been drinking, if I'd seen that or sensed it. Barbara didn't see it or sense it. I don't say I would or I wouldn't. I just don't know. I had passed up being a captain for two years. Guys in my class said, you'll be the first guy to check out. I said, you're doggone right, I will. But I didn't want to be a junior captain when my little girl was still at home. She was going to go to college, I thought. So I passed it up for two years. I went to Chicago one afternoon as we're closing in on her graduation to take a special written test to be a captain. When Barbara had taken me to the airport, she and some of her friends came and got what they wanted, left a runaway note, and Barbara found it about 11 o'clock that night and couldn't call me. I called home the next day, instantly knew something was wrong. Barbara told me where, what had happened. I panicked. My girl was gone. I told her where to go, who to call, where to look. 
I got on the airplane, and two hours later, I was home in, from Chicago to Atlanta. Now, I don't know what happened on the airplane. I don't, I don't remember feeling anything. I don't know. I'm not conscious or aware of it. But when I got off the airplane, I hated her. I hated her. More than I thought I had the capacity to hate anything or anyone. I mean, I was white hot with this. And I told Barbara, I said, I don't care if she dies in the streets. She'll never come back to my home. And I never want her name mentioned ever again in my presence. And I told the rest of the family that. And the look on my face apparently reinforced that because nobody would dare mention her name. But when I drank at home, I would mention her name. And it was always bad stuff. And it was none of it was true. And it was killing Barbara. And she said, please don't talk about her. Don't drink at home. I said, that's okay. I, I'll drink out on the road. I kind of quit going out with the crews. I didn't want to be with the crews anymore. I drank solitarily. I knew where all the liquor stores were and every place I went. I knew which ones were open on Saturday nights, closed at 8, which ones closed at 9, which ones were open on Sunday. How long it took me to change clothes, get up there and get back to my room. I'd get back to the room with a quart of booze, lock the door, turn the TV on so there was noise in there. I wouldn't answer the phone. If a crew member called, I wouldn't go to the door if they knocked on the door. I just drank. I go through a quart of booze pretty quick. First drink goes down pretty tough because I make them strong. I choke it down and the rest of them just flow down. But I couldn't get what I wanted. The booze quit working for me. It was like I was pouring gas on a fire every time I drank. I wanted that warm, mellow, I don't care feeling, that floating away feeling. Everything's okay and if it's not, it seems okay and I really just don't care. It's just not that bad, and I never got it. What I got was a replaying of everything, the self-pity, the martyrdom. Look what I'd done for her. Look how she repaid me, and the hatred got worse and worse. And every time I'd recycle this, it came up more and more intense, and I was exhausted by the time this was over. <clears throat> when Dawn ran away from home, within two days of my return, everything she'd ever owned was gone. Everything had been given to goodwill. I went to the uh, safety deposit box, and I ripped up her adoption papers. I gave an attorney $500 and disowned her, and then I tried to annul the adoption and couldn't. And as I'm cycling through all this stuff, I glance over at my wife. I think, you know, I don't think Barbara's handling this too well. She probably needs a therapist. <laughs> so I plucked a name out of the yellow pages, a Ph.D. and got by the luck of the draw, I got a good one. We saw him twice a month for two years. Never talked about drinking, and I find that amazing. Not because I tried to steer the conversation away. I didn't care. You don't want to talk to me about my drinking. I got no problem talking to you about my drinking. None. Because I wasn't an alcoholic, and I had lots of reasons. You know, I used to devise tests periodically as time went on to see whether or not I was an alcoholic. Now, most normal drinkers don't do that, but I devised these tests, and I know you'll all be surprised I passed them. And um, <laughs> I had a thin definition of what an alcoholic was or wasn't, and uh, I didn't fit. I um, <clears throat> was talking to the doctor one day. We were mentioning something. He, he started talking to me about my daughter, which I didn't like to do. I made a statement that I'd never consciously formed in my mind before, and these words flew out, and I thought, this absolutely portrays me. Later I thought that. And I looked at it and said, I said, I'm going to tell you something, doctor. I would rather hate than hurt. And that's what I did. And he said, you survived a childhood doing that, and if you continue, it'll destroy you. And later I saw that's true. Nobody's going to hurt me. My parents can't hurt me. A divorce isn't going to hurt me. Shifting back and forth isn't going to hurt me. Nobody's, Barbara can't hurt me. Because I have the capacity to get angry before that occurs. And when I get angry enough, the wall comes up and the pain doesn't come through. That's my defense. Obviously, I can't get through the wall either. But that's what I did. That was my one and only coping skill. And he was right about that. He was right about everything he told us. But that's pretty much where we were when this arrest took place. That's pretty much where we were. I went into treatment. I didn't want anybody to know who I was. I couldn't. It was a week before anybody knew the color of my eyes because I could not look up, would not look up. And... Um, Within a day or two, the media had this after the arrest. I was in treatment the day after the arrest, and um, now everybody knew. Everybody knew. And um, I knew they knew. I was just so, I was just, I don't even know how I got dressed in there. The good things began to happen to me because I was completely beaten. I was just beaten. 
And we went into a group about midway through the first week, and they closed the door. I didn't intend to talk, didn't intend not to talk. But talking in front of a group is counterintuitive to me. But for the first time ever in my life, I began to talk about my daughter, and I broke down and cried. I don't cry. I didn't cry at my parents' funerals. I sat there and I saw because I didn't have that wall of anger to stop that, and I took the pain straight on, and it hit me right in the heart, and it broke it. I sat there and sobbed about my girl, and then I felt so embarrassed. I felt like I was sitting there naked. I shouldn't have done it. The group was terrific, though. I mean, it was one of the most important things that ever happened to me in treatment. It didn't got anything to do with how tough I am or how tough I'm not, and I began to heal that day, I think. So I called, I got a hold of Bar Red, no visitors, no phone calls. I said, get a hold of Don. Let's put this family back together. Treatment people heard about it, and they said, in spite of our policy, we'll give you a day room if she can come up. The two doctors heard about it. They said, could we please come watch? And so a few days later, I walked into a day room in the treatment center. For the first time in two years, I saw my little girl, and I looked over the side, and there were two doctors watching this. The family therapist and the doctor had diagnosed me. And I looked at my little girl, and I thought, I don't remember her being that small. I wish I could tell you what it felt like to walk over and put my arms around her for the first time in two years and hug her and tell her how much I loved her instead of how much I hated her. And as I looked down in her arms, there was a five-month-old granddaughter, and she took my heart as quickly as my daughter had. My daughter got married, and I didn't even know her last name. That relationship has been healed. In the first week in treatment, I'm already starting to see promises come true, but I'm not yet aware of that. A week to the day that I went into treatment... <clears throat> I would not go near either one of the two TV sets in, in the um, facility because I was always on it. I was the lead story every time. Every news segment, I was the lead story. But, of course, as many of you know, certain patients in a patient group feel that their designated duty is to come report. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew what was going on. I knew the Jay Leno jokes. I knew all this stuff. They announced a week to the day that I'd been terminated by Northwest. That was fair and appropriate. That I'd lost my, all my emergency revocation of all my flight certificates. That was appropriate and fair. And I'd lost my medical because of my alcoholism. All of it fair. I'm a hardcore believer in acceptance and responsibility and being accountable. If you're a victim, you're a victim by choice. And I'm not a victim of anything. Not even my alcoholism because I've done something about that. I uh, quickly began to get word of legal consequences that nobody knew anything about on the day of the arrest. None of the attorneys knew anything about legal consequences. And here they came, six of them, separated by several days apart. And every time I, they'd take me out of a group, my heart would just stop. It'd take me a day or two before my breathing could get back to normal. The only time I thought I would ever be locked up was as a POW in Vietnam, not in an American jail or an American prison. And every time they take me out... The penalties have doubled. It's Minnesota's going to indict me. Now North Dakota's indicting me. Now the penalties have doubled. There's two counts. Now there's two counts over here. Now the federal marshals are coming to take me out of the treatment center. And finally I step outside and there's a doctor. And I thought, oh, my God, there's never been a doctor before. And we go down to his office. He said, I want you to sit down. I have to tell you a federal grand jury has just indicted you. You're looking at 15 years in federal prison. A $250,000 fine, and an attorney comes in Sunday and wants $50,000. I went broke in the first 30 days. I didn't have it. I said, he said, I have to ask you, are you going to hurt yourself? And I said, no. I went back to my room, and I collapsed, and I don't remember falling. What I do remember as I was laying on my carpet, I was crying again, the second time of treatment. I was crying. And I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I said, I can't do even one more time. I just have nothing left. I can't do it again. Please help me. I remember sleeping that night. I had many, many, many experiences in treatment, life-changing experiences, because I was ready for this thing. I didn't know anything about the 12-step deal. I didn't know anything about this fellowship. I didn't know anything about AA except what I was learning in treatment. It was a very hardcore AA treatment center. But I had nothing else to bet on or invest in. Fortunately, I put all the chips in the basket and went for this thing. I'm glad I did. I got out of treatment. I was immediately in trial in Minneapolis, very heavily publicized trial. I never thought I'd be the one sitting on a TV, sitting on a couch watching my sketches in a courtroom of me, and they were there. I had an advantage over the other two guys because I was the alcoholic. 
And so at night I could go to an AA meeting in Plymouth, Minnesota. Had an amazing story with an attorney that I don't have time to go into, but I lived with him during the trial because I was broke. I didn't have anything. Barbara and I stayed with my attorney. don't know of anybody that's done that before. And I had other experiences with this man. Everywhere we went, the TV cameras and crews were there sticking microphones and cameras in my face trying to provoke a reaction. There was no way I could escape it. And as I would approach this group, I was just terrified. And I would mantra the serenity prayer as fast as I could until I could feel something begin to grab hold. It didn't go away, but it helped. When I was in the AA meetings, I was scared because they always recognized me. And it took me a minute to settle in there. And I never shared in there. I just sat and listened to you. But I took that back to the courtroom the next day where they were painting me as the worst vanguard on the face of the planet. I was worthless, had no, no, I'd never been, had any value, never would. And that's being picked up on the media and the books and the, all these, you know, tabloids. There were times when I would look across the room and I would see Barbara and her eyes would meet mine and she would mouth the words, I love you. And I just nod. I'd be okay. So I got through the trial. I told my attorney, I said, I'll be found guilty. I wanted to plead guilty. And he said, we can't do it because of the media. There are other reasons. So I, I had to trust somebody. I said, okay, do what you want to do. And I said, I'll be found guilty. I know that, Peter, and it's okay. And we go in there. And of course, I was the captain. I was first up for everything. They quickly went out. They quickly came back. I knew what that meant. And so they announced, I stand, and they announced this sentence of uh, guilty. And my, my attorney stiffened, and I reached over and patted him. I said, it's okay. It's okay. We went back for the sentencing. Sentencing guidelines were in place at the time, 12 months minimum, 18 months maximum. I knew I was going to get 18 months. I was the captain. I'd made some degree of peace with that. day and a half before sentencing, I get up there uh, to my attorney's office from Georgia. He said, I knew something was wrong. He said, an hour ago, he said, I just got a letter from the uh, judge. We had drawn the toughest judge in the federal district. I never got a break anywhere along the way. Anytime there was an option or a opportunity for something to go my way. It never did, not once, ever. We had drawn this tough judge, and he said he just notified the other two attorneys and the media that he's going to depart upward from the sentencing guidelines, and he can go to 15 years if he wishes. I would felt that feeling of terror. I have no idea how many times, hundreds of times, that penetrating hits the bone marrow, and I felt it again. And Barbara and I walked out of there. I said, this is step one deal. It's about being powerless. It's about acceptance. I have no control over this. I don't know what's going to happen. All I can do is accept. So we went in there for the sentencing. Now, I was in treatment with a federal judge, and he said, i got to tell you something about sentencing. He said, that's a charade. When we come through the door, the sentence is set. Notwithstanding the fact that you're going to talk, witnesses talk, your attorney talk, he said, that's just all show. We never change from the bench. And judges and attorneys across the country have told me that that's true. So I knew what was going to happen. The other two didn't, but I did. So I knew that nothing I said was going to make any difference. He was going to do what he was going to do. I stood to speak. I was so scared I couldn't get anything. I didn't know what I was going to say. And all I could do was talk from the heart and say, I'm grateful to be sober. I'm grateful for the good things that happened inside my family. I accepted responsibility for this event from day one. I can't change what happened yesterday. I can't change what happened several months earlier. The judge stunned everyone in the courtroom because he announced a sentence on me of 16 months, two months less under the guidelines. I found out why later on, but <clears throat> nobody could believe that. And uh, I'd given my personal effects to Barbara. I said, I don't think I'll come back. He'll have his handcuffed for the cameras and led away. He also did something. He said, this is a very complex case. It's the first time this law has ever been used, and it was not designed for pilots. There are a lot of legal issues. I'll let you three men remain free until your appeals are exhausted. The other two went for that. I said, no, I'll go to prison now. I've been convicted. It's time for me to go. He told my attorney later, he said, no, offense, no defendant before or since has ever done that. And he said, I was lost for words. I told my attorney, I said, wasn't lost very long. See, I'd learned in here, everything that went, all this story, there's a lot of I and me in the first person story. It's never been about I and me. It's been about us, what I've learned in here from you. But I've learned I have to deal with life on life's terms, not mine. I'm going to prison. 
no matter what I do, I'm going to prison. I might as well do it now. And I was terrified, and I told my kids I was. But I remembered something I'd learned in the Marine Corps, and that is that courage is not the absence of fear. It's the ability to continue in the face of it. And that was now my job, was to go in the front door, because I couldn't come in that back door until I go in the front. So on December the 5th, 1990, 34 years to the day that I walked into Marine boot camp, I entered the Atlanta federal prison system. I don't talk about prison from the podium. I had a lot of experiences in there. I don't think that has anything to do with my recovery, but I can guarantee you that my recovery had everything to do with how I dealt with prison, the circumstances, the situations, and the people in it. It had everything to do with how I dealt with prison. I usually make two quick comments from the podium and say there are two groups of really, really, really sick people in prison, and the sickest group goes home every night. <laughs> and every now and then somebody will come out and go, I'm a correction officer, and that hurt my feelings. And I go, you know, if you're in this fellowship, that does not apply to you. And if that's not good enough, then go call your sponsor. Don't talk to me about it. <laughs> The other thing was that I made 12 cents an hour when I was in there, and it really irritated me because there was no 401k plan. <laughs> I um, came out. I was inmate 04478-041. I came out. I was broke. The, oh, I neglected to tell you, at the sentencing, the judge put even more sanctions on me about flying. He put a, a, a layer of concrete totally over my coffin to make sure that I never saw the inside of a cockpit again, on top of everything else, and that did it. About a year later, in a miracle that I haven't got time to go into, it's a good story, but he lifted the sanctions on me. No one thought that was possible. Not a chance in a thousand that he would do that, and he pulled those sanctions the FAA had said, if you want to fly again, you'll start with a private license. None of the people I was with thought that was possible. And I didn't for just a little while. I thought, how do I stay sober? One day at a time. Everything I do is one at a time. How about if I do the licenses one at a time? And ten and a half months later, I had four written licenses passed. But there's a flying component to that. And I looked in the books and I thought, that's going to cost me ten to twenty thousand dollars. I can't do it. I was broke. Had been broke for a long time. I'm working in the treatment center now, making $14,000 a year working in the counseling department. Grateful for that job. Loved doing what I was doing. Found out I was okay working with alcoholics and addicts. That I had a touch for that. I liked it. But I couldn't do this flying. I get a call from one of, the fellow, one of my fellow pilots up there, Terry Marsh. He said, I've got a flight school you didn't know about. I want you to come up here and live with my family and go through my flight school free. I was still under 13 conditions of probation. I went to Minnesota, checked in with their Department of Corrections. I spent 44 days up there with Terry and his family, rained out 14 days, never quit, never quit studying, never quit working. The remaining 30 days, I flew 78 hours, and I got four licenses back, two of them by 11.15 one morning. I don't know that that's ever been done before. I had amazing experiences up there, great, wonderful experiences. I came home, and I thought, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But who will hire me? Nobody. Nobody. Everybody knows about the Northwest Flight 650 incident, and they know about Lyle Prowse. My only chance to fly again was if I could find a place in Africa that never had any TV. And uh, <laughs> maybe, you know. The licenses came about a month later. And I got a phone call within an hour of receiving them from the head of the pilot union at Northwest. I had never activated my grievance, which had been automatically filed because of termination, because they were fair in firing me. They didn't fire me for being an alcoholic. They fired me for what I did, and that was fair. This pilot says to me, this is the best phone call I've ever made because three hours ago, John Dasberg, who's the president and CEO of Northwest Airlines, made a personal decision to bring you back to full flight status at Northwest. I sat there with tears streaming down my cheeks. I couldn't believe the words I just heard, that they would take me back after everything I'd done to that airline. The shame and the disgrace. Chad made Jay Leno's career. And it was north at the expense of Northwest. Jay Leno called me in June of 96 with an apology, but I haven't got time to go into that. But I thought, how, how can anybody have that kind of courage to bring me back and let me fly again? What happened if I relapsed? What happened if I had a flying incident? John Dasberg just deep-sixed his 
status as a CEO and probably his career because he took a risk and believed in me. I went back at a very emotional back-to-work ceremony and um, was and part of the agreement was you'll never be a captain again. I said, that's okay. I've been a captain. I'm all right with that. But the miracles in this program and this fellowship will never stop as long as you stay sober, as long as I stay sober. And so I went back for not quite five years, and I flew as co-pilot on 747. I was speaking, and now Northwest had a program because they'd really taken a beating over this thing. And I got to be part of the program and watch pilots come back, getting sober and getting a chance to retain their flying career. Couldn't believe that I was seeing this at Northwest Airlines. And uh, <clears throat> I was approaching my final year at Northwest. I dedicated myself every single moment of every single day to making sure that John Dasberg never ended up with an ounce of regret about bringing me back. I knew there were some naysayers there, too, and I wanted to not steal their voices. I was the most visible alcoholic pilot in commercial aviation, and I wanted to make sure that no one ever regretted bringing me back, ever. And so I spent a lot of energy to that end, and I think I did a good job. I was speaking at United Airlines, and I got a phone call late at night. My wife was with me. Coming up on my last year, the guy said, you're not going to believe it. I just got a call from John Dasberg. He thinks when you come back for your last year at Northwest, you need to be a 747 captain. I went back and checked out and spent my last year as a 747 captain. Not because I'm Lyle Prowse, but because I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and because he could trust me. So I got to fly a mega million dollar airplane with 18 crew members, 400 passengers all over the world because I'm a trusted, sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I retired honorably at the then mandatory retirement age of 60 in September of 98. And I, th I knew I'd done a good job. I knew that. And within days, my attorney called me and he said, Judge Rosenbaum just called me. He said, in 16 years, he's never supported a petition for pardon, but if you want to make the attempt, he'll support yours. Eight years after the trial, my judge is watching this. I thought, what are the chances? I thought, what are the chances I'd ever fly again? So I did all the paperwork. The judge wrote a phenomenal three-page affidavit that I have never been able to read all the way through without tearing up. The man who tried me, sentenced me, and sent me to prison has these amazing things to say about me because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of recovery, because of what this program does to us and for us. Two years later, I came walking in, and there were eight messages on my phone answering machine excitedly telling me I had just received a presidential pardon. That's huge. That is a life-altering experience for a felon, somebody walking around with a felony conviction. It changes life. I've had other things happen since then. But in the interest of time, I need to wrap this up. I'm going to tell you that the second day in treatment, we went to an outside AA meeting. I was sitting there with my head down. Can't look at anybody, won't look at anybody. And they start reading the promises. And I'm thinking, why are they reading these promises? I wonder if there's something to these. And I'm listening. And then they get to that part that says, no matter how far down the scale we've gone, I thought, that's that, that I'm out. That'll, that'll happen for you maybe, but it's not going to happen for me. I'm going too far down. I know where I'm headed. It's not going to happen. And I've had... You have not heard 70% of the story. You, I, in spite of the fact that I'm trying to get through this, you haven't heard 70% of it. Let me close with something I heard Father Martin say one time. I've been out to Ashley a number of times, and uh, he was one of my heroes. And I think he wouldn't care now if I used it since he took it from a card that some girl sent him, so fair is fair. <laughs> but it's, it, to me, it, it's kind of a philosophical expression of life that I really... Um, believe in, and, and I think it paints a, a good picture. It just says this, I do not wish you joys without a sorrow, nor endless day without the healing dark, nor brilliant sun without the restful shadow, nor tides that never turn against your bark. I wish you faith and strength, love and wisdom, and goods, gold enough to help some needy one. I wish you songs, but also blessed silence and God's sweet peace when every day is done. My name is Lyle, and I'm an alcoholic, and I thank you for having me here. I thank you for my sobriety.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.